The hunger or the desire for people to be able to illuminate their surroundings, especially at night, has been there forever. Most of the world lived in darkness from dusk until dawn. Light was very rare. Light was very expensive. Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb you're using right now. The real genius behind the lights that power your life was a black man whose parents escaped slavery, and most people have never heard his name. Before we go any further, let me be clear. Edison did create a light bulb. But here's the thing nobody tells you. Edison's bulb lasted about two days. Maybe a week if you were lucky. It was basically useless for everyday people. The filament inside would burn out so fast that electric lighting was just an expensive toy for the rich. So who actually made electric lights work for regular homes? That's where Louise Howard Latimer comes in, and his story is going to change how you think about every light switch you've ever touched. Louis Latimer was born on September 4, 1848 in Chelsea, Massachusetts. But to understand his story, we need to go back even further. Six years before Louis was born, his parents George and Rebecca Latimer did something that could have gotten them killed. They escaped slavery in Virginia. Rebecca was pregnant at the time, and she made a decision that would echo through history. According to family records, she refused to be the mother of a slave. The plan they came up with was wild. George would pretend to be white and act as his darker-skinned wife's master. They traveled from Norfolk, Virginia, through Baltimore, and finally made it to Boston. For a brief moment, they thought they were free. They were wrong. The day George and Rebecca arrived in Boston, someone recognized George. A colleague of his former slave owner spotted him on the street. Within days, George was arrested. His trial became huge. Frederick Douglass himself got involved. William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist, rallied support. The whole city of Boston was watching. Eventually, a black minister named Reverend Samuel Caldwell raised $400 to buy George's freedom. But here's the cruel truth about that time. Even though George was technically free, he had no papers to prove it. Everything changed in 1857 when Lewis was just nine years old. The Supreme Court made a ruling in the Dred Scott case that basically said escaped slaves weren't really free even if they lived in free states. After that decision, George Latimer disappeared. He just vanished one day, probably terrified that slave hunters would come for him and put his whole family in danger. Lewis never saw his father again. Imagine being a nine-year-old kid and your dad just disappears because the government decided his freedom wasn't real. With no father and no money, Lewis had to grow up fast. His mother Rebecca struggled to feed the family. She eventually had to split them up. Lewis's sister went to live with relatives. The boys got sent to a Stytron school where they trained kids in farming. This was Lewis's childhood. No real education. No father. No security. Just survival. At 16, Lewis did something that showed the kind of person he was becoming. He forged documents to make himself look older, then enlisted in the Union Navy to fight in the Civil War. Think about that for a second. This kid's father had to run away to protect the family. And now Lewis was running toward the fight to end slavery. He served on a ship called the USS Massasoit, which operated on the James River in Virginia, the same state his parents had escaped from, the same area where they had been enslaved. After the war ended in 1865, Lewis came back to Boston. He was broke. No formal education beyond fifth grade. No connections. Nothing. He started working odd jobs with his mother, doing housekeeping. But Lewis had something that money couldn't buy. He had a brain that refused to quit and a hunger to learn that would change everything. Around 1868, Lewis heard about a job opening at a patent law firm called Crosby & Good. They needed an office boy. Someone to run errands, clean up, basically do whatever nobody else wanted to do. The pay was $3 a week. In today's money, that's about $54. Lewis took the job. But he didn't just take out the trash and make coffee. He watched. Every spare moment, he was watching the draftsmen work. These were the guys who drew the technical blueprints for inventors' patent applications. Detailed, precise drawings that required serious skill with tools like T-squares, compasses, and French curves. Lewis couldn't afford drafting classes, so he taught himself. He bought secondhand books on mechanical drawing. He practiced constantly. And here's the thing about Lewis. His drawings weren't just technically accurate. They were beautiful, like actual works of art. Eventually, the head draftsman let him try some simple drawings. 
The bosses at the firm saw his work and realized this office boy was something special. They promoted him to chief draftsman. His salary jumped from $3 a week to $20. That's a raise from $54 to about $486 in today's money. And remember, this was during a time when being black meant most doors were slammed in your face. In 1876, something happened that most history books skip over completely. A guy named Alexander Graham Bell was working on this crazy new invention, a device that could transmit voice over wires, the telephone. Bell needed someone to draw the technical diagrams for his patent application. He hired Louis Latimer. The patent drawings for the telephone, one of the most important inventions in human history, were created by the son of escaped slaves. Let that sink in. But the telephone was just the beginning. By 1880, America was on the edge of something massive, the electric lighting revolution. Thomas Edison had just gotten a patent for his electric light bulb. Newspapers were calling it a miracle. The problem was, it barely worked. Edison's bulb used a paper or bamboo filament that burned out in a couple of days. Maybe 14 hours if you were lucky. It was too expensive to make, too fragile to ship, and too short-lived to be practical for anyone except rich people who wanted to show off. The technology was there, but it was useless for normal life. In 1880, Lewis got hired by the United States Electric Lighting Company in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The company was owned by Hiram Maxim, who was Edison's biggest competitor. Maxim knew he needed to solve the filament problem if he wanted to beat Edison, and Lewis got to work. Here's what made Lewis special. He wasn't just a draftsman anymore. He was an inventor. In 1881, Lewis developed a breakthrough. He figured out how to manufacture a carbon filament that actually lasted. He encased the filament in a cardboard envelope during the production process. This simple innovation prevented the carbon from breaking and made the bulbs last way longer than Edison's version. On September 13, 1881, Lewis and his assistant Joseph Nichols got a patent for their improved electric lamp. Then in January 1882, Lewis got another patent. This one was for the actual process of manufacturing the carbon filaments. It wasn't just about making one good bulb. It was about making thousands of them efficiently and cheaply. This was the invention that changed everything. Because of Lewis Latimer's process, electric lights could finally be mass-produced. They could be affordable for regular people, not just millionaires. This was the invention that brought electricity into homes across America and the world. But here's the part that makes me angry. Maxim, as Lewis's boss, owned the legal rights to his employees' patents. So when the improved light bulb hit the market, it was called the Maxim Lamp. Lewis's name wasn't on it. The credit went to the white business owner. Lewis understood how the system worked. He could have quit. He could have fought back. Instead, he kept working. And in 1882, he made sure to file his carbon filament manufacturing patent in his own name. That patent, number 252,386, couldn't be taken from him. That same year, Lewis and his wife Mary traveled to London. His job was to supervise the installation of electric lights throughout the city. London was famous for its fog and darkness. And here was Lewis Latimer, a black man born to escape slaves, literally bringing light to one of the most powerful cities on earth. He taught British workers how to make his improved bulbs. He oversaw installations in New York, Philadelphia, Montreal, and London. Cities around the world were lighting up because of his work. Then in 1884, something interesting happened. Thomas Edison, Maxim's biggest rival, invited Lewis to come work for him. Think about that. Edison knew who the real genius was. Lewis joined Edison's company, and his role was crucial. He became Edison's patent investigator and expert witness. When other companies tried to steal Edison's patents, Lewis was the one who proved in court that they were breaking the law. He was in charge of Edison's technical library, collecting information from around the world. He even translated documents from French and German to protect the company from European competitors. Edison had Lewis write a book in 1890 called Incandescent Electric Lighting, a practical description of the Edison system. It became the standard guide for electrical engineers. But here's what's beautiful about Lewis. Even in a book about Edison's system, his writing showed his soul. He wrote about the electric lamp. Like the light of the sun, it beautifies all things on which it shines and is no less welcome in the palace than in the humblest home. He understood what this technology meant. It wasn't just about science. It was about giving everyone rich or poor access to light. On January 24, 1918, Louis Latimer was named one of the 28 charter members of the Edison Pioneers. This was an elite group of inventors and engineers who had worked closely with Edison during his early years. 
It was one of the most prestigious honors in the electrical industry. Lewis was the only African-American member. Let me say that again. In a room full of some of the greatest minds in electrical technology, Lewis Latimer was the only black man. His colleagues wrote about him after he died. He was of the colored race, the only one in our organization. Broad-mindedness, versatility in the accomplishment of things intellectual and cultural, a linguist, a devoted husband and father, all were characteristic of him, and his genial presence will be missed from our gatherings. But Lewis wasn't just an inventor. He was a writer, a poet, a musician. He played the flute and violin. He painted portraits. He wrote plays that got produced on stage. He taught English and drafting to immigrants at the Henry Street Settlement in New York, helping new Americans build better lives. He was active in the Unitarian Church. He fought for civil rights, taking the stage with activists like Ida B. Wells to demand equality and justice. In 1895, he wrote a letter supporting the National Conference of Colored Men, saying, I have faith to believe that the nation will respond to our plea for equality before the law, security under the law, and an opportunity by and through maintenance of the law to enjoy with our fellow citizens of all races and complexions the blessings guaranteed us under the Constitution. Lewis also invented other things that improved daily life. In 1874, he patented an improved toilet system for railroad cars. In 1886, he created a forerunner to the air conditioner called the apparatus for cooling and disinfecting. He even invented a book supporter and a locking rack for hats, coats, and umbrellas. His mind never stopped creating solutions to make life better for everyone. Lewis's wife Mary died in 1924, and his health started failing after that. His children had a book of his poetry printed in 1925 for his 77th birthday to cheer him up. His poems were beautiful and sensitive, full of love and longing. One poem he wrote was about his wife. Let others boast of maidens fair, of eyes of blue and golden hair. My heart like needles ever true turns to the maid of ebon hue. I love her form of matchless grace, the dark brown beauty of her face, her lips that speak of love's delight, her eyes that gleam as stars at night. Lewis Howard Latimer died on December 11, 1928, in his home in Flushing, Queens, New York. He was 80 years old. In 2006, almost 80 years after his death, he was finally inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. His house in Queens is now a museum dedicated to his legacy. Here's what makes me frustrated about this story. Every kid in America learns about Thomas Edison in school. They learn he invented the light bulb. They learn he was a genius. And that's partly true. But they don't learn about Lewis Latimer. They don't learn that the light bulbs we actually use, the ones that made electric lighting practical and affordable, came from the mind of a self-taught black inventor whose parents escaped slavery. They don't learn that without Lewis Latimer, Edison's light bulb would have stayed an expensive curiosity that burned out in two days. The truth is, Lewis Latimer didn't just improve the light bulb, he changed the world. Every time you flip a light switch, you're benefiting from his genius. Every city skyline lit up at night exists because of his carbon filament process. Every home with electric lights owes a debt to a man who taught himself mechanical drawing because he refused to accept that his circumstances would define his future. His story matters because it shows us something powerful. The systems that were designed to keep him down, that denied his father freedom, that tried to erase black contributions from history, they failed. Lewis Latimer's light shines through all of that darkness, and his legacy reminds us that innovation doesn't come from privilege. It comes from curiosity, determination, and refusing to accept that the world as it is is the world as it has to be. If you found this story incredible, there are more inventors like Lewis waiting to be discovered. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the next one.